cutting edge technology could finally solve the almost decades old homicides near Lake Oconee. Obviously, mom and dad at that point were mid, mid to late 80s. If, if there was an enemy out there, it would have taken place, you know, a lot, lot, lot sooner than that. That person with that little sliver of, of uh, knowledge could, could come forward at this point. That'd be very much appreciated with our family. When are you planning to retire? Me? Yeah. Never. Never. Is this case something <laughs> that you're dedicated to finishing in your Oh, sh sure. This is a case I'm dedicated, dedicated to finish this week if I can get the opportunity to do it. But I'm, I have no intentions of retiring anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, I'm a good-looking guy like me. You picture of you, where would I go? Why would I retire? Hello and welcome. I, or welcome back if you see me before. I post every Wednesday and if you tend to watch true crime content, then I would love if you would like and or subscribe. But without further ado, I would like to get started. Today, I'm covering the case of Russell and Shirley Dermond. So to start, Russell Dermond was a New Jersey native. He was from a city called Hackensack. He was born June 6th of 1925, and he served in the U.S. Navy during World War II. Russell married Shirley Wilcox December 15th of 1950. Shirley Bell Wilcox was born July 7th of 1926. They would go on to have four children together during their very long marriage, and their children were named Mark, Brad, Keith, and one daughter named Leslie. And they would later end up having a total of nine grandchildren. Russell worked in the fast food industry and would go on to own several Hardee's locations in Atlanta after the couple had moved from New Jersey to Georgia. He would retire in 1994 and he enjoyed the typical things you would expect a sweet old man to enjoy. He enjoyed golfing, reading, and taking walks. He really seemed to want to remain as active as possible. You know, the Dermans were not controversial at all. They lived a, a, a very sedentary life. Uh, they went to church. Uh, Mrs. Derman uh, played bridge at the local bridge club. He had stopped playing golf. Uh, he, he walked on a routine basis. Uh, and uh, other than that, you know, I've got every cancel check they've written for the last eight years, their credit card records, everything. There's no reason that we can determine why anybody would be, have ill feelings for them at all. And the couple loved spending time with their family. I believe after they retired, the couple moved to a gated community 12 miles northeast of Eatonton in Putnam County, Georgia. The gated community was called Great Waters Reynolds. <laughs> he corrected Oconee to October. <laughs> I'm sorry. Lake Oconee. Blue. Lake Oconee. Lake Oconee. That doesn't sound right. Lake Oconee. Lake Oconee. Okay, whatever. That's what Google says. This gated community was called Great Waters Reynolds. I've also seen it just Great Waters at Lake Oconee. Their home was 3,200 square feet, so a very large home, and their property was right on the lake with their own private dock. And the property that they specifically owned seemed a little bit more secluded than the rest of the community. They were surrounded by a lot of trees and just kind of, they had more separation from everyone else. In 2000, the Dermans experienced tragedy when their eldest son, Mark, was murdered in Atlanta during a drug deal gone wrong involving crack cocaine, 
which is very sad. And just to note, that is, uh, as I'm saying, it's a very sad experience to have their eldest son die, but that has no connection to what I'm about to talk about with the Dermans, and the police have confirmed that. It's just a one-off, very sad tragedy. In 2014, Russell Dermond was last seen running errands on May 1st, and later that evening, Russell and Shirley would both speak to their son, Brad, on the phone. The couple had planned on attending a Kentucky Derby party that weekend on May 3rd, but they never showed up. And they never contacted, and this was their neighbor's party, they never contacted their neighbor to provide, you know, an explanation for them not being there or an apology for not showing up, which was very out of character for the couple. There were also no signs of activity from their home. That made this neighbor concerned, and I believe it was the same neighbor but I don't know because obviously this person has never been named, but one of their neighbors at least went to their home on Tuesday, May 6th to just check, to check on them. And they found the door open and they went inside and they did not find Shirley, but they did find Russell in the garage of their home and he had been beheaded. I have an emergency. A neighbor made this 911 call after finding the decapitated body of 88-year-old Russell Dermond in the family's Lakeside Edenton home. The friends had called them, friends that lived in the same area. Uh, they finally went over to the house to see about them. The house wasn't locked, walked in the house, walked all through the house, couldn't find them anywhere. Eventually, uh, the man uh, of the couple went into the garage, walked down into the garage itself, and discovered Mr. Dermond's body, uh, minus its head, uh, lying on the floor of the garage. He has been decapitated. It was a post-mortem decapitation. He was already dead. Of course, when this occurred, Ms. Dermond was nowhere to be found. So, I'm sure that was very concerning. But he was found wearing a white t-shirt, a blue bathrobe, uh, his boxers, and L.L. Bean bedroom slippers. He was lying in a small pool of blood with towels surrounding his body in the garage to apparently absorb some of the blood and keep it from seeping out under the garage door. So obviously finding Russell beheaded in the garage. The police got involved very quickly and the investigation was very concerned with finding Shirley Dermond because there was no sign of her in the house. It was only Russell's body. And they thought that she had potentially been kidnapped as they started their investigation. And they were extremely concerned for her safety. And at that point, the Putnam County Sheriff's Office involved the FBI. Specifically, it was Howard Sills that led their investigation, but he involved the FBI during the early phases to help with Shirley's abduction. And they hoped the FBI's national and international connections might establish some lead as to her whereabouts. They placed billboards in Lake Oconee, Oconee. Lake Oconee. Oconee. They placed billboards in Lake Oconee and put up a reward for information. In the Dermond home, they thoroughly looked through it and they found an incomplete but started crossword puzzle in their home and that was dated Friday, May 2nd. So the day after anyone had publicly seen or spoken to the Dermans. That is presumably the last day that the couple was alive. And they did find minimal to no blood splatter in the home. And they didn't see any signs of a struggle there either. Indicating that it was possible the Dermans were murdered elsewhere 
outside the home and Russell's body was staged in the garage. And as I said before, the front door was unlocked when the neighbor got there, but there were also no signs of forced entry into the home either. 10 days into the investigation on May 16th, Shirley's body was found by a fisherman five miles away from their home in Lake Oconee. Oconee. Oconee? I am going to hate myself for saying this wrong so many times. Whoever had put her body in the lake had attempted to weigh it down using two 30-pound concrete blocks. And Shirley's cause of death after her autopsy was determined to be two to three deep wounds in her head made by a blunt object, like potentially a hammer or something like that. Initially, Howard Sills thought Russell's beheading was meant to send a message and could have been a professional, but the professional theory, the professional theory, seems to have been thrown out the window with the discovery of Shirley's body. An amateur would probably be the one to try and weigh her body down in that way. A professional would know, according to Howard Sills, that it would not work the way that they had put two 30-pound concrete blocks on her body to weigh it down in the lake. He would also say later in a 2019 interview that professionals wouldn't take the time to behead someone and, quote, they shoot you in the head and leave, end quote. So it clearly was not a professional that killed the couple. Russell's head was never found, but according to investigators, GSR was found on the white t-shirt. Oh, and GSR is gunshot residue. It was found on the white t-shirt he was wearing, leading them to think he had been shot in the head and his head removed to prevent police from having the bullet that killed him. And as I said before, when the investigation first started, Howard Sills had involved the FBI in his investigation because... Shirley was missing, presumably abducted at that point, so he wanted their connections. But it seems that Sills was opposed to the GBI getting involved in this investigation. And the GBI is the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. There has never been an exact reason stated for his hesitancy to include the GBI, but I think it's been made clear that he did not want them involved. From my personal experience living in Georgia, I do know that they have a reputation for taking a lot of time in investigations and for taking a lot of time to get back to for getting through their log of forensic evidence that they're supposed to analyze. So that could be his hesitancy for this, just as a matter of, like, trying to get it solved as quickly as possible, but I, I honestly don't know. During the police's investigation, since their community was gated, the police checked with the 24-7 security gate at the front of the community for logs and or security footage. But the CCTV camera, or the security camera at this gate, had apparently not been working for a month from a lightning strike or a thunderstorm in the area. The monitors are there, and you can see the cameras are working, you know what I'm talking about. But we'd had a storm about two weeks earlier, and it wasn't recording. Hadn't recorded since that storm. But if it was somebody who was supposed to have been there, you know, it wouldn't have you know, it, would, it wouldn't have mattered. Security's a lot tighter now since this happened than it was at the time. And, I mean, to be fair, you, it's been out for a month and no one knew, but there had not been a home invasion in this community for over 18 years. But, you know, Security measures are only as good as the way that you keep up with them. So it is very disappointing that the security camera would not be working, you know, during this awful tragedy, but it is what it is, I guess. 
Regardless of the security footage, however, police began to suspect that someone had accessed the Derman home using their private dock, allowing the murderers to have easy access without the risk of security from the community because their dock obviously backed up to Lake Oconee. And if you come in through the lake, there's really no way to tell that you were there. So the police began to suspect that a boat was involved due to where Shirley Derman's body was found but I'm not the police. The police also initially thought that the motive may have been robbery, but nothing appeared to have been taken from the Dermond home. So robbery is kind of out the window for that one. Investigators would follow hundreds of leads, but nothing seemed to lead to anything definitive. Uh, Actually, to the contrary of that. We know of nothing that was disturbed in the home. We get letters, we get emails, we get phone calls from people. But then you have things where, you know, you you have psychics call, you you have people that call just utter foolishness. This is a person who said they weren't a psychic, but they had certain revelations that they thought they had and, and uh, they wanted to tell us that water had played a role in the case. It's just, we, we have literally hundreds of letters like this. Or, or As far as suspects, we still don't have any suspects. Maintenance workers, yard workers, uh, people like that. Their children, their adult children. We've uh, uh, found out where they were on, at the time. Uh, uh, we polygraphed them. Uh, and then we interviewed uh, hundreds of people. We simultaneously, my detectives, with, along with the FBI, and uh, detectives from other sheriff's offices interviewed uh, over 200 people one day. Certainly never done anything like that before. More recently, however, Sills has said that they have done geo-tracking of the area around the Dermond home and gotten that information through the FBI who fitted the info into their software program. And I know the FBI has a really good reputation as far as this geotracking method. They are very good with, you know, I'm not going to pretend to understand how it works, but I know that they have a good reputation for it. This info would provide basically a list of people in the area of the Dermond home during that time. And they were working to see if any of them in any way are related to the Dermans or were at their home specifically. More answers as cutting edge technology could finally solve the almost decades old homicides near Lake Oconee. 11 Alive's Don White joins us live now here in studio with the breaking developments and reaction from the victim's son. Don. Joe, I spoke to the son of Russell and Shirley Derman just hours ago. He is hoping and praying new cell phone evidence can help the family learn what happened in the final moments of their loved ones lives. We spent a lot of time together, close knit families. Obviously, mom and dad at that point were mid mid to late eighties. If, if there was an enemy out there, it would have taken place, you know, a lot, lot, lot sooner than that. Brad Derman is a victim's son. He says their murders make no sense, as the couple had no known enemies. Items of value that were left in the house, not, nothing was taken, you know, that, that kind of thing. This cold case is always on the mind of Putnam County Sheriff Howard Sills. It's been eight years. I'm sorry. This is the sheriff's first unsolved homicide in his 48 year law enforcement career. But there's hope, thanks to new technology not around when the murders took place eight years ago. The FBI's, uh, I, I got the data. Uh, I've taken it over to the FBI, and uh, they are using a software program that they have. And uh, we're going to delve into it and see what we find. Sheriff Sills has been anxiously awaiting the cell phone data. He hopes can crack the case and give the Dermot family some answers. We'll take this data. We'll identify who's in the area, see who they are, you know, see what kind of backgrounds they have, see who they've contacted, and uh, eventually start uh, tracking them down, interviewing them personally. That person with that little 
sliver of, of uh, knowledge could, could come forward at this point. That'd be very much appreciated with our family. And I mean, you do have a nice range to go off of because we have the second through the sixth. So anyone at the house in that time frame would be suspicious because obviously the Dermans had not been found yet. And the second is presumably the last day that the two of them were alive. So you have a four day window of if anyone is at their home instantly being suspicious up until of course when the neighbor found Russell's body and reported it to police. But as far as I can see, this has not resulted in anything definitive either. There have been new updates on the case, and Sills would report sending out evidence to a private lab in Houston for analysis, but did not share what type of evidence it was or what he hoped would result from this evidence. In a recent interview, quote, This case stays with me more than any case because we don't know who did it. We have a terrible murder case and it's now nine years down the road and we still don't know who did it. Sills would also say, quote, I think about the case a lot, end quote. In May of this year, it was reported that the lab operation in Houston called Othram had discovered some new DNA on whatever evidence that the police investigators had sent off. Sills said that the new DNA could be the most significant case development in years. Now, investigators hope that same lab can warm up another Central Georgia cold case. It's been nine years since someone brutally murdered Russell and Shirley Derman in their Putnam County home. Ashlyn Webb spoke to Sheriff Howard Sills and an executive of Othram Lab. She joins us in studio with more. Yes, Sheriff Seals told me he learned about Othram last year and flew out to Texas last fall to deliver evidence in the Durman case. He delivered more in March. Now he says he and investigators have even more of a reason to be optimistic. They have developed an amount of DNA. Sheriff Howard Seals says they got a DNA hit off the evidence. This could very well be the Durman's DNA or or some officer, possibly even um, Uh, could have uh, left this DNA. He says to ultimately determine that, Othram Incorporated will have to do more testing. We spoke with Othram's chief development officer, Kristen Middleman, about their technique. She says scientists use what's called forensic genetic genealogy, a combination of DNA sequencing and tracing family trees. We singularly focused on how do we get that intractable evidence to give us the best looking DNA profiles that we can so that we can upload them to these genealogical databases. And they don't have to have DNA from the suspect in the DNA database to identify them. They can trace it back through family trees as distant as the suspect's fourth or fifth cousin. I'm optimistic about it. Uh, the Oath, Othram Company has a tremendous reputation. Still says this could be the lead investigators need. He says until now, investigators had hit a dead end. No suspects, no persons of interest. For years, many speculated Russell and Shirley Derman's murders were a professional hit. Professional killers, they come and shoot you in the head with a 22 Magnum and leave. They don't take a body five miles down the lake and do an imperfect effort to uh, conceal the body. They just don't do things like that. Sills says he believes the couple knew their killers. There was no sign of any forced entry or any resistance. Sills wouldn't say what evidence they got this DNA hit on. He says that could put potential prosecution at risk, but he says they are determined to solve this case. Frank Glory still says this is his only unsolved murder in 29 years as Putnam County Sheriff. He says he thinks about this case every day. Back to you. And I do want to note there is an outstanding award for information leading to an arrest on this case and I believe it is $45,000. I think the biggest factor in this case, though, is the house, the way the house was when the neighbor arrived. And specifically, I remember reading that some of the police thought that the killer may have been coming back to clean up. I don't know where they got that. But 
it seemed like an unfinished cleanup job. Like them just leaving the towels there seemed kind of peculiar, it seems, to police. And the towels that were found with Russell Durbin's body are probably the biggest piece of evidence that I can see in this since they already said that the house really didn't have that much. There wasn't that much blood spatter. There wasn't that much. There wasn't signs of forced entry or robbery. So all you really have is Russell's body and the towels that were found with him. So I think, I think that's probably what was sent off to the lab which makes me a little hopeful that the DNA that they had found is genuinely new DNA, but there are obviously still questions, including is the new DNA that was found just the Germans? And most importantly, is there enough of this DNA to run it through CODIS? Because you do have to meet a certain threshold as far as sample size to run it through CODIS. But as far as I can see, these are still questions. I'm hopeful that this case will have a suspect and or an arrest, but I mean, I just hope that the family gets answers one day. Yeah, I just hope the family can get answers one day. So I know this is a short video. I appreciate you watching. And yeah, um, I will be back next Wednesday.